Well, I'd like to thank our women's ministry for uh, putting together a wonderful appreciation for all the gals in the congregation here, whether you're married or not, mother or not, in some way I know you touch lives around you. So I think we should put our hands together for all the women here today. We love you, we appreciate you. Have you ever been desperate for rain? Now, I got to be honest with you, I had this sermon planned long before today. <laughs> Some of you might have taken your boats to church, I think. But uh, in any case, uh, have you ever been desperate for rain? You know, most of the time, we don't like rain, do we? We want to stay out of it. We try to keep dry. We wish it wouldn't come, but I don't think we really realize just how vital rain is. In fact, um, as I was thinking and studying uh, for the sermon and, and, and really kind of thinking about rain, I, I kind of was having a conversation with my family a couple days ago at, a, at our, our, our morning worship, and I was saying, you know, plants can grow without sun. Now, I know the sun is always shining above the clouds, but if the sun never shines through the clouds, plants can still grow. Isn't that right? But if the rain doesn't come, plants can't grow. They can grow without the sun shining, but they can't grow without the rain falling. When I was in college, I took a couple years out to be a student missionary, and my best friend Bob and I went about halfway around the world to a place called Cagayan de Tawi Tawi in the local language there. It's called Mapun, but it's an island in the Philippine archipelago, and if you can see, it's, you, you don't even see it. It's actually right about there, uh, and, and it's so remote that most Filipinos don't even know where this place is. In fact, Roberto and his family were here at first service, and I asked him, Roberto, do you know where that's at? And he said, no, I, I've never heard of it. So, so anyway, we were out there, and um, we, we went to uh, teach in the Adventist school there and uh, do some mission work. And, and we were actually in the village of Gupa. Now, this is a, a closer-up picture, thanks to Google Maps, of the island itself. It's a volcanic island. It's got several extinct volcanoes on it. They're not very tall mountains, but there are about two or three of them. And uh, these, these three lakes right here are actually lakes in the craters of, of extinct volcanoes. And uh, we were actually working in a village of Gupa, which is in this area of the island. And uh, the thing about Gupa is that that was a village that had no water. There was no stream that ran through the village. It was not by the shores of a lake. There were no wells for water in the village. The village of Gupa was completely dependent upon rain for its source of water. It, and so all the bamboo, you know, the bamboo huts, they would have coconut thatched roofs on them. They'd have bamboo gutters along the edge and they would catch the rain in barrels to supply their water. Now, my, my friend Bob and I, when we were there, we lived in, in a bamboo hut, but it actually had a corrugated metal roof on the top of it. It still had bamboo gutters. And there was actually a metal cistern behind our, our bamboo hut that was, uh, would catch the water off the roof. And it was the source of water for not just us, but all the staff that were there at the school and, and the families that lived on the campus teaching in the school. So you can imagine that in the village of Gupa, water was very, rain was very precious. Have you ever been desperate for rain? Not long after we arrived in Gupa, the rainy season came to an end and the dry season began. You understand in, in, in that part of the world and in, in the tropics, there's only two seasons, right? Right? Rain, wet season or dry season, that's what, what, that's what they call it. And, and, and the dry season dragged on and on. Weeks went by and there was no rain. And the water level in our cistern was going down at an alarming rate. At least it seemed to me that I'm, I'm used to, I come from a place where you just turn on a tap and the water comes out, limitless supply. 
And I was worried about this water level going down and, and the weeks turned into months and there was still no rain. Our water supply was getting critically low. Everyone on the campus and at school was getting desperate for water. The last of the water from the cistern was in our containers, in our different huts, as we were using it and running out. The situation was critical. We gathered for prayer, for special prayer, that God would send us rain. Now, I have to be honest with you that we'd been praying for rain for weeks and even for months. I mean, you don't think just when we got to the last drop of water we started praying. No, we'd been praying. We'd been praying for a long time for rain, but God had not answered. And so everyone's faith was weak. We had to fight against the doubt that was threatening to creep in. Have you ever been desperate for rain? We were. In the village of Gupa, the staff of that school, we were desperate for rain. But my question today is this. Are we desperate for spiritual rain? And are we pleading for that rain. Heavenly Father, I ask that You would come among us. And as we study today a topic that perhaps some of us have never heard about, a topic that used to be of, of common conversation, but now has dropped from view. I plead with you to make your word come alive. I ask that you would speak to us, that you inspired us with, with, with the picture of what you want to do in the midst of your people in these closing hours of earth's history. Heavenly Father, do what only you can do and use this broken clay vessel that I am. Please use it to bring forth your word and to bring us all closer to you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 6. Today, in our journey of seeking for revival, I want to study something called the latter rain with you just a little bit. We're only going to scratch the surface here today. There's, there's really so much to be said about this, but, but we're just going to scratch the surface. Now, now I, I want to begin by saying years ago in the Adventist church, this was a big topic of a conversation. It was a big, important topic. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was preaching about it. I was just a kid, so I wasn't paying much attention. But even as a kid not paying much attention, I realized that this was a big deal. I realized it was important. Sadly, however, it seems that in today's church, this has really dropped off of our radar screen we never seem to hear about it anymore. People don't really talk about it. We don't preach about it. And that's a serious problem, folks, because the la without the latter rain, neither the world nor us as the church will ever be ready for Jesus to come. Hosea chapter 6, and I want to start reading in verse 1. Uh, as, as we begin to take a little bit of a look at this here today. Come and let us return to the Lord, for He has torn, but He will heal us. He has stricken, but He will bind us up. After two days, He will revive us. And on the third day, He will raise us up that we may know, that we may live in His sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. Now look at this. He will come to us like what? Like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Now, Hosea begins this passage 
with a plea to return to God. Understand, Hosea is, is, is a really a prophet of revival. That's what he's doing. His ministry is during the waning years of Israel's existence as the northern kingdom. The nation is spiritually and morally bankrupt. Child sacrifice, gross sensuality characterizes the nation's worship of Baal and Ashtoreth, even though they should be worshiping the true God. None of the Ten Commandments are being kept at all levels of society, including the rulers and even the priests. They're all involved in this this terrible apostasy. And so the landscape, the spiritual landscape, it's just a complete disaster in the northern kingdom. And it's into this setting that God calls Hosea. And by the way, you understand what God was doing with Hosea, don't you? Remember, he's the guy that had to marry what? A prostitute, that's right. And and what God was doing was he was using Hosea to physically illustrate what was happening spiritually between him and his people Israel. How they were playing the harlot, how they were living in an adulterous relationship with the world, and and how they were cheating on him and not being faithful to him. And, And Hosea's ministry in life was a physical illustration of what was going on. And in the midst of all of this, God... God's love for his adulterous people is steadfast. And he doesn't want to see them go down the road they're going down. And he sends Hosea with a call for revival. Here in chapter 6, Come, let us return to the Lord our God. And notice that in verse 3, at the end of the verse, it says that God will answer that prayer and, and that he will come to his people like the former and latter rains. Now, to understand the latter rain and what it's talking about, the latter rain of the Spirit, if you're following along in your notes, first of all, we must grasp that God's work is like Israel's seasonal rains. This is the first point I want you to understand as we begin to look at the latter rain. God's work is like Israel's seasonal rains. Agriculture was a big part of their world, and so the rains that would grow a crop and produce a harvest were a really big deal. They were really important. And God compares what he would do in the plan of redemption to the timing and the function of these rains. God says, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come to you like the former or the early and the latter rains. That's how I'm going to work in your midst. So first I want to give you some observations about these rains, and then we're going to make the spiritual application to us as God's people today. Now in Israel, the early rain actually comes in the fall. It actually falls uh, in late October and early November for our months. In, in Israel's calendar, it would fall during the month of Heshvan. And, and the early rains are actually a lighter rain, or is a lighter rain that softens the ground for planting the seed. Okay, and and so think about this. Now, I want to point out to you that we we think of of planting in the spring and harvesting in the fall. Isn't that right? That's the cycle we're on. So we always think about the, 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 the crop cycles, plant in the spring, you harvest in the fall. But in Israel, it was the exact opposite of that. So they would plant in the fall after the early rain, And then they would harvest in the spring. All right, so it's very interesting. Now, the early rains in the fall were very important, as I said, to softening up the ground that was hard. You see, all summer long, the sun beat down, no rain, and the ground would get hard, it would get parched, it would get dry, it would get dusty and and very hard. And so the, the early rain was very important to softening up the ground so that the farmer, they could plow it and then plant it and it could receive the seed. And the early rain also gave the necessary water to help that seed germinate and begin to grow. Now, third of all, the latter rain actually comes in the spring. 
That's when the latter rain comes. It comes during our months, late March, early April, during the month, the Hebrew month of Nisan, also called the month of Aviv. And so that's when the latter rain falls. Now the latter rain is a little bit different than the early rain. The latter rain is a much heavier rain that ripens the harvest. Now, if these rains, if the latter rains had come in the fall on the dry, dusty ground, they would have only caused devastation and flooding because there would be no growing seeds whose roots would be in the ground to hold it all in place when those rains came. It would only wash it all away. And so the latter rain coming at the wrong time would not be good. There has to be a preparation for it, you see. But coming at this point in, in the spring, the latter rains, would then give the crops the, the added boost that they needed to ripen into a bountiful harvest. So that's a little picture of, of how the early and latter rains function in Israel. La, early rains in the fall, October, November. Latter rain in the spring, Fe, uh, March, April. Now let's go to the book of Acts together. Acts chapter 2. I want to get the spiritual parallels uh, that the early and the latter rains uh, teach us that, that were happening in Israel and, and why God used that illustration. So in a spiritual sense, as we're talking about this, the second thing that I want us to understand with regard to the latter rain is that in a spiritual sense, the early rain launched the gospel work. When Jesus ascended to heaven after His resurrection, He left His 12-week disciples behind right and, and they were the ones that were supposed to spread the gospel and, and so when he left and he had these 12 weak guys left behind the, his work needed something to, to, to get it going something to jump start it and what was that thing that was necessary to start the gospel work in the world Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 when the day of Pentecost had fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were all sitting then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and, and one sat upon each each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance drop down to verse 16 but the, and Peter as he's explaining what had happened he's saying but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass in the last days says God that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy and so here in the book of Acts, chapter 2, Luke is describing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And Peter explains what was happening by quoting from Joel chapter 2 about the Spirit being poured out on all flesh. Now we're going to get to that whole passage in Joel in, in a few moments, a little later in the sermon. But what you don't see here in Acts, as Peter quotes from Joel 2, is that it talks, before it talks about the Spirit being poured out, it talks about the early and the latter rains. And then after it says the early and latter rains, in the context of talking about rain, that's when it talks about the Spirit being poured out. So in other words, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is compared to Israel's early and latter rains. Just like there were two rains in the Bible that were necessary to the growth and the harvest of the crops. Just like there were two rains, there are two outpourings of the Holy Spirit. Whoops, sorry, what's going on here? Okay, so the first insight that I want you to get here is that the Spirit's outpouring at Pentecost began the spread of the gospel. That's the first thing that I want us to know about these two outpourings. The first one, the early rain, that 
is what began the spread of the gospel. Remember that in, as we talked about the early rain, it was the lighter rain that would soften the ground and prepare it for the seed to be planted and also provide enough water so that it could germinate and begin to grow. Well, in a spiritual sense, the early rain of the Spirit was necessary to start the gospel, the spread of the gospel and the growth of God's kingdom by softening human hearts so that they could receive the gospel seed and it could take root and germinate and Christianity could begin to grow and spread. In fact, as you read about the early rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in the book Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White talks there about how how before when they tried to preach there was not much response, but when the Holy Spirit came down, he took that word and, and it says it cut through unbelief like a mighty sword and hearts were touched because they were softened and they were made receptive by the mighty presence and power of the Holy Spirit so that the gospel message could be received and thousands and tens of thousands of people were converted as that Holy Spirit came in the early rain outpouring. Now, that's in the macro sense. So there's an early rain that happens to the church corporately, to the church as a whole that's necessary for the world. But I want to point out a second thing here, and that is that we also need a personal early rain experience. Now, I don't know why this keeps skipping on me. Here we go. We need a personal early rain experience in our own lives. Not only did the church as a whole need the early rain, but we need it individually as well. We begin to experience the early rain when we are born again and give our lives to Jesus and the Holy Spirit begins His work growing us to be more like Christ, and we begin that Christian journey. That's what the early rain experience is. It's what softens our heart towards the Lord, isn't it? It's what causes us to begin that journey of growth, and and by the way, it prepares us for the ongoing work. This is not a one-time deal, you see. It's not just supposed to happen when I get baptized, but it prepares us for the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit as He changes us to become more like Jesus in our characters. This is a critical experience to have. And I want you to see why and and how it's described. It was by by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples were prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So we're talking about the early rain here, and it tells us how they were prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then it says the same work, right? Only in greater degree. What's the same work? Confessing and forsaking of sin, earnest prayer, and consecrating ourselves to God. She says the same work, only in greater degree, must be done now. And, and, and here's what I love next. Get this. It is God who began the work, and He will finish His work, making every man or woman complete in Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad of that, folks? You see, we can't do this ourselves. We can't do this work in ourselves. God is the one who began it when the Spirit came and touched us and softened our heart. That was the work of God. God is the one that draws us to Himself. And, and He begins the work, and He is the one, the Bible tells us, He who began a good work will what? complete it. And so we have to keep this in, in mind and in the context of what we're talking about, this character growth. we got to cooperate with God. We can't do it. We can make ourselves available, and we got to be willing. But God is the one who will do the work. I praise Him for that. She goes on to say, but there must be no neglect of the grace represented by the former rain. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Two great outpourings of the Holy Spirit. Early rain, latter rain. Early rain, it says the latter rain is going to be, it's a heavier rain. It's going to be more abundant. But if we don't live up to the light we have now, folks, we're not going to be able to receive the greater one that's coming. And so we don't want to neglect this work of grace that comes with the former rain. In other words, God's goal for each of us is 
to perfect our characters and to make us complete in Jesus Christ. And it's God's work, and He begins it in our lives as the early rain conversion. But we must cooperate with Him and allow that work to continue on in our lives by confessing, forsaking sin, by earnest prayer and consecration to God. Why is this important? Because in Israel, without the early rain, the seed would not sprout at all, and thus there would be nothing to ripen for the harvest. Are you following me? Without the early rain, nothing would be there for the harvest. Why is this important? Because spiritually, if we don't receive the early rain in our own personal lives, then we're not going to be able to receive the latter rain. And without the latter rain, you and I will be lost. Listen. We may be sure that when the Holy Spirit is poured out those who do not receive and appreciate the early rain will not see or understand the value of the latter rain. Wow. The early rain experience is absolutely vital and necessary in order for us to receive the latter rain experience. If we want to receive the latter rain, we must experience and appreciate the early rain in our lives first of all. So let's diligently pursue a conversion experience with Jesus Christ. Let's go in our Bibles now to the book of Joel because I want to try to bring this all together as it relates to the latter rain. We've been talking uh, thus far about the big picture. We've talked about the early rain and its importance and what it is and why we need it. But now I want to look at the latter rain together. And and, and so once again, the, the two periodic rains, the two seasonal rains of Israel, symbolize two great visitations of the Holy Spirit. One at the beginning of the gospel dispensation and one at the close of it. So the early rain got the crop growing, started growing, but they needed the latter rain in order to mature and be ready for harvest. Is this making sense? Okay, are you with me? So early rain gets it going, but if there's no latter rain, you're not going to have a good harvest. You see, without the latter rain, those crops that were growing, they would shrivel up, they would shrink, they would wither, and they would die, and there would be no harvest at all. Joel chapter 2, verse 23. Oh, by the way, before, before we read that, the third point that I want to make is this. The latter rain closes the gospel work. Early rain launched the gospel work. The latter rain closes the gospel work. This is an end time message, dear friends. And so Joel chapter 2 and verse 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down to you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust is eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there shall be no other my people shall never be put to shame oh i love these verses if you go back to the beginning of chapter two you see it's talking about the great and terrible day of the lord this chapter is an end time chapter and in the context of that god says i'm going to send you the latter rain and it's going to be in abundance right First of all, I want you to understand and realize here, the first lesson that we find is that the latter rain produces an abundant harvest. That's what the latter rain does. It produces the abundant harvest. 
the Bible said here, threshing floors full of wheat. It said vats overflowing with oil and a new, new wine and oil. That's awesome abundance. It talks about the years that the locust has eaten. It says, God, I'm going to restore them to you. Dear friends, if you feel like you've been going through a wilderness, if you feel like life has been stolen from you and, and the enemy has taken up years with foolish choices and bad living or, or tragedy or, or, or difficult experiences that weren't your fault that you went through. If you feel like the locust has been on at your life, wait for the latter rain because God says he's going to restore all of that to you. It's a wonderful news. It says that he's going to take away uh, his people's shame and he's going to cause his people to rejoice. That's how powerful the latter rain is. Remember that at the beginning, we learned that the early rain was a lighter rain and the latter rain was a much heavier rain. Remember, we, we, we saw that, right? Now, here's what I love, folks, because the lesson is that the, the, the Spirit's outpouring just before the end is more powerful than Pentecost. That's what it's going to be, more power. In other words, if you and I look at back at Pentecost and we think the early reign of the Holy Spirit was powerful and we're in awe of that, then imagine what the latter reign is going to be like. Imagine what's going to... Uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in, the, in these end di days will be heavier. It will be more abundant. It will be more powerful than it was even at Pentecost. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? But I praise God, that's the promise. The latter rain is going to be more abundant than the former rain, the early rain. And, and what's interesting is the latter rain has two functions, both of which are needed and they need to happen before Jesus can come. Number three, one of those functions is that the latter rain completes an inward character work in God's people. Over and over again, as you study the application of the latter rain, you see that God sends it to complete the work that He's begun in transforming our characters to be like Jesus. It really deals with bringing an inward character work of forming the character of Jesus within you and me to a completion. It deals with that. Listen to this. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. And by the way, this is before Jesus comes again. This is not after. This is before. This is to happen before. It says the, the, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. We are to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. Now again, who's doing the work? Is it me? It's God. It's God doing the work. He's the one. That, and then it goes on to say, we are to be wholly transformed in the likeness of Christ. The latter rain, ripening earth's harvest, represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. But unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up. Unless the early showers have done their work, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. Dear ones, our characters do matter if we want to go to heaven. Don't let the devil lull any of us into a false sense of security thinking that grace covers willful sin. False sense of security. It's not our work, it's God's work. And God is able to do beyond, abundantly beyond what we could ever think or imagine, church. God is able. Place yourself before Him. Let Him have His way in your life. We've got to live up to the light that we have. And, and I want us also to notice that unless we have the early rain experience, the latter rain is not going to do us any good. Not only that, without the early rain, we will not even recognize the outpouring of the Spirit in the latter rain. We're told that it could be falling on hearts all around us, and we won't recognize it or receive it. In fact, this is what blows my mind. When I was reading in um, uh, Selected Messages, and she was talking about 
the outpouring of the Spirit, the early rain, the Pentecost experience. And, and, and what she was saying was that, that, that the reason that God hasn't given us the latter rain yet is because if He poured out the Spirit today like He did on the day of Pentecost, we would do exactly what the rulers and people back then did. We would reject it. We would say, oh, they're just drunk with wine. We're not ready for it, church. God is desperately wanting to give it, but we're not desperate for rain. We're not ready for it yet. We want to walk around with our umbrellas. We're trying to keep dry. And and, and so this, I mean, this is such a sobering thought. If we have not experienced the early rain in our lives, then we're not going to be able to experience the latter rain. Dear friends, this is why I am so passionate about each of us having a daily relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're not doing that, then with all the love and urgency that I can muster, I want to appeal to you. I want to appeal to you to change that and change it soon because if you do not change it soon, you will not make it to heaven. You will not make it to heaven. You will miss the latter rain. And when Jesus comes, you will be calling for the rocks to fall on you and hide you from Him when instead you could be looking up with a great smile on your face, splitting it from ear to ear. You could be looking up with arms outstretched saying, Oh, Jesus, you've come for me. And you could hear Him say to you, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come on and enter with me into the kingdom. That's what we could hear if we have a daily walk with Jesus. But without it, folks, we're going to be on the wrong side. We're going to be on the outside looking in. And so the first function of the latter rain is to do the inward character work to make us like Jesus. The second function of the latter rain is that it completes an outward conversion work in the world. Just as the early reign of the Spirit launched the gospel message into the world and tens of thousands were converted overnight, so the latter reign closes the gospel work in the world. But the best news is that just as the latter rains were more abundant and heavier than the early rains were, I want to tell you what, folks, instead of tens of thousands being converted, when the latter rain falls, tens of millions will be converted overnight. Hallelujah. That's Sometimes it seems, folks, as we look around us, that hardly anybody in the world is interested in God. Hardly anybody in the world is going to be saved. It seems, it seems like we're, we're in a losing battle. It, it seems like we're in a lost cause. But here's what i got to say. When we look around like that and we think that way, it's because we have not taken into account the latter rain. We have not taken into account the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days. And so what's going to happen with the latter rain, that's what turns the tide, dear friends. That's what turns this thing around. And that's why when in vision John the Revelator gazed up into heaven and, see, and sees the, the saved all around God's throne, he says in Revelation, it was a great multitude which no one could count saved from all the nations of the earth. Oh, hallelujah. The latter rain does that, church. The latter rain turns this pitiful little group into a great multitude that nobody could count. Jesus triumphs. It's what gives me, this is what gives me hope and courage to press forward in this journey, dear friends. The latter rain. But how can I begin to impress upon us that the greatest need of both the church and the world is the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is the end time revival that we've been studying about in my last three messages. This is what we are crying out for. There is nothing we need more than Pentecostal power in this end time hour. We talk about finishing the work, but we're no more able to finish the work without the Spirit of God than the disciples were able to begin it without Him. That's why Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and what? Wait. Wait until you receive power from on high. 
That's why Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1 says, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of when? The latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Oh, I praise God for that promise. Ask for rain, God says. By the way, in my reading and studying in the Spirit of Prophecy about this subject of the latter rain, and by the way, what she wrote was 150 plus years ago. Do you know what? Over and over again, she says, now is the time of the latter rain. We have a great problem with the Adventist church that we think the latter rain is future. And we're waiting for it sometime off down then. Dear friends, it is to be now. It was now 150 years ago. What is wrong with us? But I'm so excited because God says, ask for rain in the time of the latter rain. He's telling us, ask for rain now. He wants to give it, folks. Let's not rest satisfied that in the ordinary course of time, rain will automatically fall. God says, ask for rain. The growth and perfection of the seed does not rest with us. God alone can ripen the harvest, but our cooperation is required. God's work demands from us the action of our minds and the exercise of our faith. We must seek revival with our whole hearts if the latter rain is to come upon us. But here's the great news. God says, ask for rain and I will do it. If we pray for the blessing in faith, we will receive it as God has promised. Ask for rain. Back in that parched village of Gupa, we gathered for prayer. We were, we were down to our final hours of water. We had to have rain. We prayed earnestly. We struggled with doubt because God hadn't answered prayers for months. But we confessed that doubt and we asked God to, to strengthen our faith and forgive us for our unbelief and work belief in our hearts. And we searched our hearts and we confessed anything that, that we needed to that had to do with that. Sometimes it was private things to confess to God. Sometimes it might have been something between some of us there in the group, the staff, whatever it was. We confessed it and we asked for forgiveness and we made things right. And we told God that he knew our need and he was well able to supply it. And after we were done praying, and it was quite a long time, after we were done praying, my friend Bob and I, we had, we had an assurance that God was going to do something. So we went to the principal of the school and we asked him for some barrels. He asked, why? Why do you need some barrels? We said, well, our gutters have leaks in them. And we want to put the barrels under the leaks to catch all the water that's going to leak from them when God sends the rain tonight. Now, I don't think that he really thought. I could see it in his face. He didn't think there was going to be rain. Doubt was all over the place. But he helped us find three more barrels. And we put them under those bamboo gutters where the leaks were. Bob and I went to bed. We fell asleep, trusting God to send rain. And do you know something? He did. We woke up in the middle of the night to a tropical deluge of rain. I mean, we were so excited. We jumped up out of bed. We didn't care. We went right away. We went. We kind of slid down the ladder because the bamboo huts are all raised up off the ground five, six feet away. We went down that ladder, and we are running around out in that rain just getting drenched to the skin, enjoying every minute of it, jumping up and down, splashing in the mud, praising God that we were soaked to the skin with rain. And do you know what, folks? The rain that came, it filled up that cistern to overflowing. And all the leaks in the gutters filled up all the barrels that we put under them to overflowing. And God filled the campus with water. And there was great rejoicing. Great rejoicing. Oh, dear ones, that's what God wants to do for us. 
to give us the latter rain outpouring of His Holy Spirit in great abundance. But the question is, are we desperate for rain? Are we desperate for rain? If you are, I want to ask you to join me in making this your prayer. I will begin praying regularly. Make it a part of your daily devotions. I'll begin praying regularly for the early rain experience to prepare me to receive the latter rain outpouring of the Spirit. May God's people today abandon their indifference to the outpouring of the Spirit in final last day power. To relax our efforts in spiritual growth at this time will prove fatal. To fail in faith and prayer in such a time as this will be to fail in gaining heaven. This is the time of the latter rain. So church, God says, ask. Ask for rain because He's waiting to pour it out abundantly.